Okay, so we are starting out with a, a, a little chat from Alan Stanley, and Alan's going to introduce uh, Andy, and we're going to go forward from there. And then we'll change the agenda on you again, just to make sure you're awake. So ladies and gentlemen, Alan Stanley is the Director of Environmental Services, and he and I deal an awful lot with each other. And of course, he does a phenomenal job, we all know that. He even has a really good sense of humor. Help me welcome him. Um, so I'm not kidding, I, I did tell Andy that we just got the word that we were on after lunch and I think he did go to the bar, so <laughs> we're on. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, it, it's uh, a great pleasure to actually in introduce you to Andy, and if some of you might have seen Andy out on the lake. Uh, this summer, and uh, you know, a, a scruffy looking character with a dry suit on, looking a little stressed. And you know, knowing that, you might not recognize this uh, fine looking uh, young, sharp dressed man beside me. And this is actually Andy. You know, just you guys uh, have seen him out there, you'll know what I'm talking about. So, this year, we had, we had some uh, community workshops uh, uh, last year, and the overwhelming response from these workshops were. were were two main thrusts. One, get more divers on the lake and start looking at some biocontrol. Start looking at uh, the weevil, the bug that could possibly uh, uh, eat uh, and destroy some of the milk. So that was in 2011. In 2012, we really took that uh, that forward. Um, Andy was uh, his new supervisor. He was tasked with putting two crews on the lake, doing all that organizing, all those logistics, and he. Uh, he, he did uh, an admirable job, so I'm really pleased um, to uh, be able to pass this on to him, and he's going to do the balance, most of the presentation, and at the end, if there's any questions, we will both answer questions uh, as for anybody's uh, you know, unanswered, uh, unanswered uh, thoughts. So, you know, again, welcome Andy Gilmore. Thank you, Alan. Uh, I'd just like to thank everybody for coming. And uh, like Alan was saying, I just over the program last year, and this was actually the first year that we implemented a two-crew program. So I'm going to start quickly talking about that, and then we will cover a few other things. So this is the 26th year of the program running on Christina Lake. So it's been running for a long time. And over the years, the weed growth has become larger in Christina Lake. So we were able to gain a budget increase of about $160,000 to double the dive group bring us to a total of seven divers this year. Uh, we are hoping to get eight, but we weren't able to get one last person. Hopefully next year we'll be able to get a full two crews of eight divers. <clears throat> so this year we are working seven days of a week on the lake for a total of 24 weeks. This was the longest stretch of work that's ever been done in Christina Lake. We started May 7th and finished on uh, November 1st this year. The goal of the two crew program was to double or even triple productivity with keeping the cost as low as possible. So this was down to working seven days a week and utilizing our boat for every day without having to get another boat. We leased Paul Freeman's boat one day a week on the Thursday. So <clears throat> two crews were able to work with three hours of diving per day, bringing the total dive hour hours to 84 hours per week. This brought our total dive hours from the year previous of only 36 hours per week to a total of 84 hours a week, boosting productivity to about 230%. There's a picture of the crew and the two boats, and there's also two extra people on, the, on that day, those are the environmental people that helped us find and locate the, uh, the weevils in the lake. As you can see, I'm not quite dressed as, uh, as I was on that day. <laughs> Thursday was the day where both crews worked together, and we usually targeted severe problem areas in the south. Uh, we utilized our super crew, as we started calling it, to target areas that were previously abandoned due to overwhelming growth. Chad Freeman was also um, promoted to the lead hand. He ran the boat when I wasn't on it. He did a fantastic job this year. 
So the main goal of utilizing two crews and doubling our budget was to retake areas that had been abandoned in the past. That was typically the Southern Bay from La Valley Point, stretching along the shoreline to roughly Silver Birch Campground. Our goal was that we retook most of the entire Southern Bay, with a few ex exceptions, um, where work was just done around people's docks and boat areas, but the entire shoreline was not able to be controlled in some areas. We were also able to retake provincial campgrounds in Crown area that was previously abandoned, and that was all done in total completion with the exception of Treadmill Creek, um, which is going to be our main goal for the beginning of next season. In the Southern Bay alone, over 250,000 plants were removed, which was never done in the last three years, so this was a huge increase in productivity, and we were moving four to five truckloads every Thursday out of the Southern Bay alone. This is just a uh, brief overview of some of the most problematic areas, including Shuley's, Christina Lakeside, and Christina Sands. Um, these areas, were controlled to the greatest degree possible, but there's still some plant growth in the areas. So that will be another goal for next year's group. There's a slide of Treadmill Creek, and you can kind of see the density of the plant growth that we encountered there. So we were able to remove most of that area, but there's still remaining plant in the deeper, up, in the deeper areas, and we'll return there next year. This is the first year that we GPS all the buoys in the lake that we're responsible for um, implementing and removing at the end of the year. And these coordinates will be used in the future to monitor these areas. There's a picture of the Sutherland Nature Park there, and you can see some of our buoys there. We also installed a GPS boat tracking on the boat this year to help the public uh, monitor where we're working, just to provide uh, updated feedback of what we've been accomplishing and where we're working on the, on the lake. Um, we did have a few problems because the GPS glitches out um, in some of the northern areas where there's no cell reception, so we're working on fixing those for next year. As I mentioned, we're also um, beginning to implement the biological control of the weevils, and that's going to be a process that's going to go on over the next couple of years. Goals for 2013 will to be establish a full eight person dive crew and begin working as soon as possible, weather permitting, and work as long as possible and as long as the budget allows for. We'll continue working through the problematic South Bay and covering the entire shoreline of the lake as we continue to do each year. The provincial campgrounds will also be targeted and control will be sought to be re remain <coughs> at a high level in these areas. We will also continue to run in the most cost-efficient program as possible and provide a transparent work program for the entire community. Is there any questions? How do you dispose? Um, we, take, you we take the weeds every day to Dave Duran's nursery and we dump it there. It's used as an organic fertilizer. Thank you, Dave, for letting us continue to dump there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you have to... Um, Manually pull the whole plant, or is the root that you have to pull as well? Yes, we uh, work at the very base of the plant, removing the, the plant stems and destroying the infrastructure of the, of the root bed, and careful to try not to let any fragments escape because it uh, spreads the fragmentation. And then we uh, dispose of it into a mesh bag, and when the bags are full, we return them to the boat and get new bags. Uh, <laughs> How, 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 how deep are their root bases? Um, the plant grows to a maximum of 30 feet in the water, and the roots can be over a foot long in some areas, depending how long the plant has been growing in that area. Uh, like the more often a site is controlled, the smaller the root base will be. So uh, in the South Bay, for instance, it wasn't controlled for the last three years. When we got in there this year, the root beds were incredible how, how big they were and how deep they went. Yes. Um, having seen the video on the Weevil program and been quite impressed with it, we 
what's happening in the state. Realistically, how long do you think it will be before we can see the day when we can go swimming down here at the South Bay and not be cloyed with uh, weed oil? Um, you probably need to direct that question to maybe Alan. I'm not, I'm not sure the exact uh, question. There is a process that we're working through uh, introducing a species into a body of water uh, is an incredibly delicate uh, process. If you, you saw Barb's presentation earlier, and uh, you know, we could, the, the authorities are taking a, a very cautious approach to this, and, and you can see why. There's a, any number of horror stories and disaster stories when introducing something um, that uh, uh, you know could potentially take off and you have all this, the you know the law of unintended consequences. So it is a native species. Yeah. Yes, we have determined that it is a native species. This was the process that we did. We uh, we commissioned a presence absence survey for the summer. That was done. There was a number of samples. I think. 13 samples that were sent off to a federal lab for set, uh, testing and DNA testing and confirmation that it was indeed the species we we're looking for. That confirmation has been confirmed. It's now back in the hands of the province, and there's a number of um, biological control specialists that are working through a process that they have said that they will get back to us early in 2013 to let us know what might happen next. Uh, it's quite unprecedented that there's a, a local government, a small local government such as us, actually goes forward and does this type of work to try to get uh, approval to try something like this. Like we are, we are way out beyond the uh, beyond the pale in terms of this. These are this is usually done by senior governments, provincial governments, and in fact. What we hear from the senior staff at the provincial level is that they think that this is a really, uh, the potential benefits of this to a lot of other areas in the province are, are so high that they feel that they should be taking the lead on it, not us, which we felt all along, but we, we couldn't wait. There was, the community was saying, go and do this, get this done. So now that we've started this process, you know, we look at the potential benefits for the Okanagan, for the Shushwap, you know, it's, it's huge, so really the province does have a role to play in this, and, and, and they, they acknowledge that, at least at the senior staff level. So when can we say that you can swim in the beach with the, uh, uh, you know, clear, clear beaches because the weevils have eaten all the, uh, all the, all the milk well? Uh, right now, uh, you know, that's, that's a coin toss. Uh, but it does, things do seem to be sort of firming up in terms of what a, 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 a reasonable process would be. Anybody that attended the meeting last year, and I showed this jokes flow chart as to what we, we considered the process to be, it seems to be getting a lot better than that. So uh, I can't tell you, but what I can tell you is that we've made a tremendous amount of progress. We've got a graduate student here uh, attending this session looking to figure out if there's something that she can do in her program um, that will help. So there's a, there's a lot of things that are coming together, um, but the day when we actually release Weevils into the South Bay is, uh, if I was to tell you when that's going to happen, I, it would just be speculation. Thank you all. Do um, you have a question? Yes, I was swimming off the sandbar at the beginning of the end of the Avenger this summer, and I was quite dismayed to see all of these pieces of cut milk oil come floating down, heading down the creek. What happens to that? I mean, I collected it and, and, and took it to show, gave it to Marilyn and put it in the garden. But what happens to all the pieces that are merrily floating down the creek? Um, they would end up in the Kettle River, I guess, and then into the Columbia. Oops. And the you know, things flow downstream and it becomes, unfortunately, somebody else's problem. So we do try and discourage uh, the public from cutting, uh, but it's also done, sometimes the storm creates a lot of plants coming down and also boat traffic, so things flow downstream and it's not good. I'll, I'll make a comment to that. Whenever you see anybody cutting their milk and letting it go, it's great that you pick it up. But also, don't feel shy about telling them that it's wrong to do that, and they're creating millions more plants. And um, 
And also remind people that when they do pull the mill foil out, pull it beyond the wetted width <laughs> so it doesn't just grow there and then the next high water it just fragments again. So yeah, we learned so much from these guys about what we should, shouldn't do, but you just can't be shy about telling people not to do it, I guess. I mean, sometimes they're a little bit angry, but it's the truth. Right? Yes. Alan, Alan makes fun of me. He only, he only remembers me because I'm the one who talks about this because they're out to kill my husband. But nobody's done anything about this. Who will think of my husband? <laughs> <laughs> the ski slalom course that gets set up every year, and you can sit there and you can watch those ski boats go down. And when they make their loop around, they they don't care about your buoys around the mill foil. They just make their big loop and come back. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of the mill foil is coming from. That's floating down the creek because it's. It's so, I mean, the picture of Tregnell Creek, it's so dense down there in the areas off the off Shuley and Christina Sands and Christina Lakeside. Yeah, I agree, and it's <clears throat> it's great to have the RCMP boat on the lake. I don't know if they do much patrolling in the way of that. I know the boat course you're talking about, and I don't think it's set up in the best location, but uh, other than the RCMP boat on the lake, I'm not really sure who would have any jurisdiction on speaking with those people. <laughs> when, we, when we do see boats inside of our buoys, we, have, we do ask them to leave, but I don't really have any authority on on that sort of boat traffic. It's more just like a respect thing. You think that people would have courtesy to the lake, but some people don't. Okay. Anything else, uh, Mike? Uh, more on our on our favorite uh, topic, uh, Andy and Helen, and this relates to uh, some recent uh, comments on the. Uh, uh, Okanagan uh, Regional District website in which they uh, are, are now starting to mention talking about biological control for um, uh, Eurasian water milkwa. <clears throat> and the politics of this thing uh, concerns me. Um, and um, Alan, you and, and Andy alluded to this briefly, and Alan, you sort of suggested that the line forward might be a little clearer than it was uh, six or eight months ago. Um, and you know, having taken an initiative um, through uh, uh, your team and, and with Grace's help uh, to, to move this thing forward, uh, my, uh, question really is if uh, there's a, a weevil hatching facility that decides that it's going to be created with provincial government funding or regional district funding in the South Okanagan, <clears throat> targeting um, the South Okanagan, if you will, for the presence of Eurasian water milfoil in, in that area, providing they can confirm the existence of the particular species of, of concern. Um, because there was always a question of whether or not there was a, a viable business uh, opportunity for some company to set up a rearing facility. Um, so what I what I what I hear you saying is that there's no chance of all of this happening in 2013. There might be a possibility of this happening in 2014 if it doesn't get lost in the political overtures between different jurisdictions. And what can we do to expedite this process and make sure that it, it doesn't get mired in political infight? Thanks, Wade. Okay, um, what, what, what we'll do is let's let's uh, let's be careful to uh, make sure we're talking. Uh, there's two there's two things going on. At least two things going on. There's many things going on in this, but uh, the uh, the work that we've been doing to date has really been to prove that the, we have this species in the lake, and and then to go through the regulatory process. What is required on the regulatory perspective to actually inoculate the lake or introduce well, it's not an introduced species, and I think that uh, there are, there might be some of the people that are more familiar with this than I. Uh, once we prove that it's in there, we use a different terminology. But at any rate, the process to be allowed from a regulatory perspective to 
to put like say 125,000 of these things in the lake. That's what we're worried about right now because until we get that question answered, the question of rearing them and and such is pretty much irrelevant. Now we could right now, there's nothing against going and rearing them as we speak right now, we just might not be allowed to do anything with them. So there was a big question and there's a lot of uh, potential here both in the Okanagan and in the southern uh, to, to the south of the states, um, if, if, this, if the efficacy of this weevil proves to be high, then there will be a lot of people that want to buy a lot of weevils. Uh, there is a, now we received a presentation from the Enviroscience, which is the company in the, out of uh, Ohio, I believe, that uh, specializes in this, and, and they've got an incredibly low cost System. She says that she raises, she rents, uh, you know, mini warehouses and buys wading pools, uh, you know, from the local Walmart and, and raises them this way, like as about as low cost as you can, and just and she, she just does it long enough to get enough weevils to actually go and do the program, and then abandons the site and gives it back to the owners and you know, gives the swimming, <laughs> swimming pools away. I think that, that what they're saying is they've got some intellectual property that in terms of how they raise them and, and whatnot, and, that, and they're, they're quite playing that one quite close to the chest. So that's, but that's on a commercial side, so we could just pay them money. Now, that we always thought there might be an opportunity to, uh, you know, business opportunity. There is this facility in the South Okanagan that uh, is a government-funded facility uh, I can't for the life of me imagine that, uh, you know, if you include all costs, capital costs and such, that they could actually do it any cheaper than this, uh, you know, than renting many warehouses for a short period of time. So those are two separate questions. And how we proceed at that point, once, once if we either get approval to do it or don't get approval. So we get approval to do it, then we have a decision to make. Do we try to get involved with this, uh, this publicly funded, um, facility in the Okanagan, or do we just simply, to get it done, hire the outfit that comes in and does it kind of like a barnstorming tour? So those are good questions, but right now, we don't know, you know, it could be, it could very well be cheaper just to hire them to come in and do it. Okay, so, so, the, so really the question is on the permission side? Right so now. It, it's the, the arguments of, of what are the potential risks involved in um, doing this uh, limited 50, 75,000 weevil test in one relatively restricted geographic area, say in Christina Lake or somewhere else. Yeah. And who's prepared to sign off on making that particular experiment? We've got some very senior provincial staff that specialize in biocontrol on, on the terrestrial side, very interested in, in figuring out how they can expedite this. Um, they, they're, they've been very grateful that we actually haven't gone political on it and kind of let them sit back and think about it. <laughs> so so I, I'm, I'm reluctant to say too much, too much more than that, but I will also say that the Okanagan is running into some pressures that we all, one of the, one of the things that we talked about a lot was mechanical control and rototilling in particular, and they're starting to run into regulatory pressures because there are some organisms in the lake, a clam, a small clam, a mud clam or something, I think. Rocky Mountain red muscle, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Scientists, you know, I'm an administrator. I can tell you how much they cost, I just can't tell you their name. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so, so they're running into some regulatory issues, so this, this, this move for them to actually want, want to look at another tool, another mechanism, is getting a little bit more um, urgent. So things are, seem to be lining up. But at the end of the day, we, there, there's still some questions about how well the whole process works. Mm -hmm. So this whole efficacy question, and there's work being done on that too, which we, we are monitoring on a, on a basis, and I think that that's what we might have to talk to our graduate student about. <laughs> I wanted to do something too um, from that meeting, is that when, uh, speak up, sorry. Uh, uh, no, I don't remember. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sick too. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> oh no, it's different. Well, they were saying talking about years and years in Ontario and Quebec. So, how far we've taken this in just a year is pretty phenomenal. 
Uh, it had been eight years. Um, well, I, I, and, and uh, um, I was talking to Barbara Stewart the other day, and she's, she's, she's been an observer and a participant in a lot of these processes, and she was sort of marveling oh, at yes. how, how, how quickly things seem to be moving. So, you know, uh, you push, push the right buttons in the right place, and maybe something will happen. There's a lot of us pushing a lot of buttons. Yeah. <laughs> Cheap button pusher. <laughs> One question. This has been bothering me for a while. If you do introduce this little beastie to eat the milk foil, will the um, gathering of the milk foil cease because you would gather them up too and presumably destroy them? Why not? So we're not introducing it. Well, yeah, yeah and, and again, this, this, this kit question of introducing versus something that's already here. We've always considered that the, uh, a weevil program or a biocontrol program and a dive program would be very compatible. There's a lot of areas in the lake that we can hit with the dive crew that are fairly sparse and they're more like recreational uh, values on the north end of the lake where it's steeper. We could hit some of this, these areas. And on the south end where it's much, where the populations of the milk oil are denser, would be more uh, the, the, the target zone for the uh, for the weevils. So we think that uh, if if we can get this program evolving to the where we have the two two tools in our toolbox for this one, the dive crew can hit all those more sparse spots and hit, and clean them out like crazy, and we can use the bug for the uh, for the really dense uh, uh, beds on on the shallow or south end. So we think it we think it would work really well together. All right. Thank you very much to the tag team A and A, Ellen and Andy. <laughs> okay, so we're going to have a short presentation while Barb changes over the equipment here, and we have with us. We are very fortunate today, actually, to have Connie Herman with us, um, and we're going to ask Connie, Connie Herman to to chat with us just for a few minutes. And she is a resource officer for the Ministry of Lands, Forest, Forest. Lands. Lands. Okay. That's, that's really what I should be doing, is Claire and wine. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, the Ministry of Forest has gone over to changes over the last couple of years. Can you hear me now? And um, we used to be compliance enforcement officers. We dealt strictly with logging forestry range related issues. Now the government has taken um, direction from other provinces and created a national resource ministry. It's incorporated part of the Ministry of Environment, water, um, for instance, is now part of Forest Lands Natural Resource Operations. I'm a natural resource officer. We have two in Grand Forks. Um, I have a little brochure here. Uh, it's an educational campaign to let the people know <clears throat> what has taken place because not everybody keeps on top of what's happening in the political circles in Victoria. But it affects us here on the ground and not a lot of people are aware of that. So, um, so as a natural resource officer, I have some special conservation status. They've just given us park ranger status. Uh, we, we deal with lands issues, we deal with manual tenures, um, we deal with forest and range practices, we deal with uh, wildfire management issues. So, um, so the broad range of it is covered in here. We do a vast extent, and we cover, and, and within the legislation that those acts cover, we have narrow authorities. So in the Parks Act, we don't, we're not like a park ranger. <laughs> But we can enforce certain things, whereas before, only a park ranger. So limited resources, limited bodies. You know, um, Dave Webster, I have a special conservation status. I don't deal with fishing or hunting regulations. I don't carry a gun. Um, but I, I do deal with um, open, burning, open burning smoke regulations, um, dangerous wildlife protection orders, um, and water water issues. So uh, we're here, we're in Grand Forks, we do not have an open office. Uh, we take, you know, Gina at the front at Service BC will direct the people to a phone to call us in the back. I don't have any of my cards here, but um, we, uh, we can be contacted through, you know, 
Frank County, BC, Inquiry, BC, come to the office, ask for one of us. Um, we're really there to monitor and manage what's happening on the landscape um, because uh, there's a lot of a lot of users of the landscape there to mediate some of the users' issues and make sure that some of the values that people in the province have established as um, worth being retained that we can carry out that mandate. Um, sometimes with various governments, the laws change, so some of our authorities do get limited. Um, but we always need people standing up. We're not there to be big brother, but there are issues that um, we can deal with. So that's about it. Thank you. Water, what exactly? Um, we do water and well inspections. Uh, the Water Act is an old act, it's like 100 years old, yeah. <laughs> and really the priority for that is um, making sure everybody everybody has a right to water in the province. Um, but priorities when water shortages come, when um, the, the levels get lowered, that the the first person who got that water license on that water is the first priority. So it's, um, there, water, water is an emotional issue. We have a lot of conflicts around water because um, it's, it's the essence of life, essentially. And <clears throat> people will have conflicts with their neighbor, and uh, yet everybody has rights. So we, have, we, will, we try and facilitate some sort of cooperation. Mm -hmm. Right? Or enforcement of, of, of legislation. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you are doing the smoke uh, fire program. Open, Open burning. Burning smoke um, regulation. Pr prior to now, we call the Forest Service, the Southern Forest Service, and they give us a permit for open burning. Uh, are you going to be instead of that now? No, I'm not a, a permit issuer. I'm okay. an enforcer of okay. the regulations. So somebody, somebody's burning and they're not following the appropriate uh, procedure, which is to follow the uh, venting index. It has to be good for that. So you're going to light and fair for the following day. So somebody just decides, oh, it's raining. I'm going to light this pile and yet the, the pressure is low and the smoke is going out of the neighborhood. They're not. And, and the index for the day was not good, then we can be called and follow that up. Uh, your information, do you have a website where we can get all this information what you do? Um, yeah, National Resource, or okay, so the ministry is Forest Plans and Natural Resource Operations. So there's a website there, so it will go to National Resource Officer. So kind of you. Right, unless it is, um, unless it no holders lands, um, there is, yeah, no, like the Wild Fire Act, if there's a, a the complete campfire ban on we have the authority to go onto private land. The Land Act, we have authority to go on private land. And, um, dangerous Wildlife, too. Dan dangerous Wildlife, um, we have the authority to go on private land. So there are there are pieces of legislation where private land is affected. Can you enforce the Environmental Management Act with respect to littering? Yes, that's one I forgot. Yes, and we do do that. Like um, it's very hard yes. to to um, to actually successfully prove that somebody has dumped their garbage, even if there's identifying information. Depending on the office of themselves and they're willing to go in front of the judge, etc. If the person um, disputes the ticket, but we've been doing a lot more of that, and people tend to just pay the fine. And, and so, yeah, um, the best thing for the, my my what I like to tell people is if they see people dumping, you know, and they don't put themselves at risk by getting a license plate number, or they're willing to witness, or they just want to call us up and honest, anonymously. That's fine too. Um, we, I, I, you know, I would put the gloves on and look through the garbage and try to find something and talk to the people. Just a quick follow up. So the call up is that through the uh, line? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Okay.
And we have the rat line up cards over here. Yeah. Okay. Um, this fellow here, you had a question. Oh. Okay. Um, do you do, uh, do you have information about pack rats and the uh, poison? Yeah, no. That would be, um, I don't know if Dave Webster, the conservation officer, deals with a lot of that. I know he, because he deals with live animals and there's legislation about how they, um, how long you can capture a wild animal, you know, such as rattlesnakes or raccoons. I'm not sure about pack rats, but you could, you know, you could phone Fire DC and ask them who you should talk to about that. Well, it's uh, a lot of people are into cross country cabins and mm -hmm. and boys it's really Oh the, the pack rats yeah. moving in? Oh yeah. Yeah, true. usually just you know How long are that we have problems with beavers on the lake? Do you look after beaver problems? Um well yeah. we do. Oh, good. Yes. Usually it's directed through the um, rap line because the conservation service, they will pass on um, issues to us that we can deal with, not hunting or fishing issues, but issues such as that. Yeah. Right. So the rap line. Yes. Just wondered if, if the changes happen to control the alien species regulation, whether you'll be able to inspect boats. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, I, I don't. We have a job for you. That would, you know, that would be another addition to the list. Yeah. So we're we're flexible, obviously. Um, are you speaking instead of Dave Webster? Are you speaking? No, no. He's okay. a conservation officer, and he works for the Ministry of Environment. Oh, okay. Bonnie, thank you so very much. Oh, Bonnie, oh, thank you for <laughs> Great information. We need all of that. We, you know, because places to go, right? Who do we contact? Thank you, Connie, for doing that. And you know, Connie did this on spur of the moment, so give her a beat. So you see the little character running around here. His name is Les Johnson. And just to let you know, Les is phenomenal at what he does, and we are now live online. So please <laughs> behave. <laughs> okay, so we are of course fortunate just before lunch to get to listen to Jenny Colesell. And and you know a lot of these people I work really closely with through the Kettle River uh, initiative and, and and so so many things. Uh, stewardship. They're all interconnected, all of them. And Jenny and I have been working together actually for a long time now, and she's done some just some fantastic work. So she's project coordinator, Granby Wilderness Society, and she's going to be discussing the mandate of the Boundary Habitat Stewards, who is involved in opportunities for further community involvement and current riparian habitat projects on the Kettle River. Ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Jenny Colson. I've been coming to these things for a couple of years now, and it is the best gathering we have at the Boundary. And, and I met a lot of you for the first time here, and it's, it's a joy to be here, even on a sunny, sunny day like today, I'd be nowhere else. And um, it's a privilege to get here talking to you. So um, I am going to talk about, I wear a couple different hats, and first of all, I'm going to address the uh, right carrying of Cottonwood project that um, I've been involved with uh, under contract with the Canadian Wildlife Service first, and then I'll go into the funner boundary habitat stewards and what we're doing and who, what, where, and the project. So, um, Canadian Wildlife Service um, contracted me to look at the Cottonwood riparian habitat areas in uh, certain portions of the boundary. And the idea was to come up with a list of prioritized sites for restoration and conservation and associated um, tools and measures to come with each site to promote conservation. The objectives were to determine the extent of uh, riparian cottonwood habitat in the study area, to identify criteria to use in prioritizing these sites, and incorporate stakeholder input um, into the criteria and the restoration priorities and also meet with local government to assist in the implementation of conservation measures to protect these habitats. 
So a bit of background why we care about riparian and river health. Um, it provides critical habitat for um, multiple, multiple mammals and birds. Um, it maintains healthy hydrological functions and it contributes to viable agricultural production systems and also creates um, multiple recreational opportunities. In Western North America, um, less than 1% of the land mass is riparian areas and they provide more habitat for avian species compared to all the other habitats combined. Um, in the boundary, in our dry climate here, riparian areas are even more important. Um, typically, the riparian area here is the black cottonwood plant community, which is um, provincially a red listed plant community, and they're among the rarest communities in the entire province. Um, there are also, in other areas as well, on um, the Columbia Basin area, there was a big project on the uh, cottonwood stands, and it was recommended to the Columbia Basin Fish and Wildlife Compensation Board, Board as a uh, top priority for conservation. And pressures remain on the fragmented stands that we have. There's urban and agricultural development, alteration of hydrological regimes, timber harvesting, mining, livestock, grazing and wild grazing, um, and recreational uses. So this is a study area. We did the Granby River from, we looked at the Granby River from the confluence in Grand Forks to 10 Mile Hummingbird Bridge. And we looked at the Kettle River from the confluence to where it disappears coming from the states and then where it, where it disappears in the midway up to the Kettle River Provincial Park. So what I did is I looked at um, aerial photos and went through the study area and on a mapping program outlined all the cottonwood riparian um, habitat and the boundaries were, um, the boundaries used was the available floodplain data that we have. And as you can see on the, on the top right, the resolution is a bit fuzzy, so it all depends on what great quality base data you have in order to do this. So for the prioritizing these sites, more difficult than you think, um, we first thought that we use um, the presence of nesting birds. Environment Canada for the last two years has been doing um, Lewis's woodpecker surveys and have a really good database for this area on nesting on nesting sites. Um, and also the western screech owl is a priority species, they're a red listed species originally as well. So we thought that the presence of these could be a surrogate for identifying priority habitat. However, the Lewis's like to nest in those thin, thinly in sparse cottonwood areas and maybe won't, maybe aren't the best surrogate they, uh, um, for other species. Other criteria we identified was just opportunities that are available for stewardship, um, other stakeholder partner collaboration and interest in different sites, uh, the presence of other species at risk, um, contributions of to a larger area, making bigger intact sands, and if they contribute to a connectivity corridor, if there was any imminent threats, and other fish, other values such as fisheries and other land uses, and uh, future protection. So, as I said, um, Lewis's maybe not give you the best indicator of <coughs> quality habitat. There's kind of a, a representation. There's a lot of Lewis's in the stand of cottonwood, but maybe the understory isn't the best. Um, so there's also, if you use scientific methodologies and apply it to our area, but you need the data present, which in a lot of cases we don't have. So the thought, next steps is kind of gonna use a focus group approach to identify and prioritize areas. Please continue on with this. Um, during, the, during the project, a lot of stakeholders and, and address some threats. So as I mentioned before, urban and agricultural development, uh, just tree removal. There's a lot of uh, recreational pressure, pressures. Um, in Grand Forks, a lot of trails have been built, and now that there's trails, there's danger trees, and of course, safety takes priority, and now the trees have to come down. Um, there's large game browsing, the alteration of flow, and future loss of in-stream cover. 
Uh, there's also lack of exclusion fencing, a lot of livestock in the riparian areas, and also road maintenance. There's a lot of riprap that's needed to uh, make sure that our roads stay in place along rivers. Um, and large, uh, especially in the, in the North Fork area, a lot of people talk about beavers and that they were taking down all their large remnant cottonwoods, so that was also identified in it as an issue. Uh, just a little tally of the quantity of riparian cottonwood we have uh, left here. Um, mainly the point, the point of the slide is to look at the, the percentage of private versus public public lands. A lot of these areas are on private lands, which makes conservation a lot of um, a big challenge. Uh, there's some uh, pictures of some private land on the Granby River. Um, and just a comparison as well, in the South Okanagan and Smokemeen Valley, this was in 97, there's less than 500 hectares of riparian cotton left. So this is just a map product that you know, we can create and hand off to planners and, and government to uh, identify high conservation value areas. So some measures and tools we can use for these sites is setting aside public lands for protected areas. Private land stewardship, purchasing private lands, manage tree cutting activities, um, get more danger tree assessment happening, uh, maintain and restore natural hydrological regions, and manage grazing pressure, and incorporate best management practices into development, and incorporate policies and bylaws that might help um, with protection. Uh, so future direction, um, I know we are I'm getting more funding to continue with this work um, from CWS, so we're going to continue prioritizing riparian habitats and uh, work with the Kettle River Watershed Planning Process and their riparian working group that's about to commence, and uh, look at selecting some sites and get some detailed restoration plans in place, and of course promoting more stewardship. So a change of my other hat, I'm project coordinator with the Grand Wilderness Society. And we look to, mostly we look to work with community groups and communities and provide education and on the ground conservation work. And we really try not to get involved too much with the, with the politics and what's going on. <laughs> This is the last day for the management. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the other one? No. <laughs> um, so, a bit of background about what Grand Wilderness Society does. We're involved with a lot of a lot of projects. Um, we have done riparian work. We're involved <clears throat> in the restorative justice process that Connie helped uh, initiate. And um, we've done some planting of cottonwoods on some ranches along the Kettle River, some kids up there on the top. And we also do water quality monitoring with youth across the boundary from Rock Creek to Grand Forks. And we've even had Curlew participate once. That's a group of kids in Midway. Um, there's Saddle Lake. It's full of goldfish right now, eating all the little amphibians. So we're working to educate people as well about invasive species. Um, this year we got some seed funding money for looking at um, feasibility of um, enhancing mountain goat habitat in uh, Gladstone. So I'd like to touch base with you on, on that. Um, and also the Kendall Grammy Grizzly Bear project. We record sightings and try to get an idea of their distribution. We also collect hair samples for DNA analysis to build a genetic identity for this population. A couple of our bears wandered down to Washington this year through Sheep Creek. So Washington got their first grizzly bears in quite a while. They're quite excited and looking to us to see how we're protecting them. Um, but further recognize the need for more stewardship. This is Ward's Lake. I um, can't really tell because the sun's all different right now, but once was wildlife reserve. So always, always a need for more stewardship. So uh, a couple years ago, I we helped initiate kind of the collaboration of uh, the groups across the boundary, and we decided to call ourselves the Boundary Habitat Stewards. 
And we look to educate, identify, and implement projects to enhance fish and wildlife habitat across the boundary. Um, as you've heard, we're kind of in between Ticton and Nelson still, and you know, sometimes we're a big data gap. So uh, I think that we're going to be a good local voice for, for habitat here. Yeah, and the, uh, you should sit on a meeting one of these times. Um, it's, it's amazing to hear all the ideas that are generated and these real professionals on the group too. So all these biology geeks talk of, yeah, it's great. <laughs> Um, so as I said, we uh, do have some projects that we've helped start getting on the ground and are doing ourselves. Um, Lisa Tedesco, she would be here, but she's not today. Um, she this year applied to the Habitat Conservation <coughs> Trust Fund for implementing some ecosystem restoration projects in the boundary. So she got $250,000 each year for the next three years to implement five different site prescriptions. Um, and with the support, we wrote letters of support for her and the Grand Forks Wildlife Association a couple weeks ago spent 120 hour, man hours thinning um, a site of Volcanic Creek. And then uh, we, Grand Wilderness Society, have uh, contributed about 28 hours of pellet counts, which is counting scat. It's a way to monitor wildlife. You do it pre-treatment, post-treatment, you can see if there's an increase. But we didn't take any pictures. And, uh, I, I tried to get some from the group from the name, but couldn't find any. What is the MFLNRO Ministry. Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations. <laughs> That's the one we're all having trouble with. <laughs> <laughs> so um, another project that Barb Stewart got going, um, she was successful in getting some eco-action funding. I think it was $30,000. Over $25,000. $25,000. 25, um, and the grassland restoration is going like this because that's how it makes my brain feel at least. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, quite, a, it's, it's, it's uh, quite a task and Barb is brave enough to undertake this. This is a picture in um, Boothman's Oxbow Provincial Park. This is actually down in the Oxbow Moor, but um, she's going to do a restoration grassland project on the top bench there. And this is uh, BC Parks Conservation Biologist Kurt Safford and Lisa Tedesco and our, range, our new range manager, uh, Ray Pavan, he is now. Um, and up top there on the bench, we did a walk through an assessment and to look at the grasses, what existed there now. And we couldn't find one native plant at all. So it'll be exciting. And uh, Christine Lake Sturgeon Society and Grand Wilderness Society will. We're going to help with some um, educational things and whatnot when the project's going on. There's a lot going on with it, so it's, it's pretty exciting. Um, and then this spring, we did the uh, <coughs> the Open and Union Crossing project. Um, Connie also identified these critters a couple years ago, and I had seen them, and we're like, oh my god, there's so many getting squashed on the highway. <laughs> what are we going to do? So this is the area. Um, this migration happens with the first warm rain in spring and then the last warm rain in the fall. And it's pretty, it's pretty incredible, incredible to see. Um, you can see Gilpin Creek Forest Service Road there, and uh, that's the concentration of the crossing area. And up on the top right is a tiger salamander. I think we documented five of those. And on the bottom right is a bucket of spade foot toads, both their listed species. So we had this uh, two, two sections of fence that we put up and it was a little bit confusing to think about it, what side of the highway, which way are they moving and when are they moving and we had some really great volunteers, Doug Shannon was out there lots and Brenda and uh, probably about a month straight we went out there and just took temperature and, and to see if there was any critters moving yet. Um, yeah, Interfor donated the role of uh, lumber wrap for us to make our fencing out of, which was great. And when the event did happen, it was it was quite impressive. It was hundreds, thousands probably of um, of frogs and salamanders, but mostly it was the common Pacific horse frog and the long toed salamanders. Like I said, we got five of the tigers and then a couple of the spadefoots there. But there was another crossing further towards Grand Forks on Atwood Road. Whitehall Road um, between Atwood Bridge and the highway, I guess that whole road was covered in spadefoot toads. So, 
So we'll kind of revamp the project and see where we should put our effort more because you concentrate on specific horse frogs when there's hundreds or do you go to the, you know, the species at risk where there's not as many. So um, it will continue. And there was a migration in the August 8th thing that happened. Um, they were coming back to the hills. So, yeah. Um, and then other initiatives that we do, um, I think Brenda mentioned she's bringing in the wetland keepers course this summer that we're all going to participate in and we put in our hopes and dreams for what the course will teach us. And others, um, we're doing a bathhouse project across the boundary. There's, I think, about eight people from Christine Lake who are looking to get a bathhouse. Um, we got I think there's five TELUS poles sitting in the mom's driveway right now, <laughs> waiting to be used. They donated after the windstorm. I saw them replacing poles, and I went up and said, "What are you doing with those old poles?" <laughs> so we got a bunch. Um, and the City of Grand Forks Environment Committee has also pledged five hundred dollars towards the project as well. Um, other things we look at pursuing stewardship agreements with communities about different species at risk and, and whatnot. And we have many, many more dreams and hopes and aspirations of what we want to do. And um, also funding, um, one of our hopes and dreams is to perhaps establish a local conservation fund one day for the Boundary community. Um, I did throw out a few figures, but we, you know, restoration work costs a lot of money. And um, we do, we have brought in quite a bit of money to the community and, and it gets to go to contractors and, and and whatnot in, in each of the communities. So, um, that's it. Literature I used. Oh, yeah, our Christmas bird count is December 22nd this year, and it does include half of uh, Christina Lake um, up to about Texas Point. So, if you're a bird or get hold of me. Yes, yes. I got to get rid of that all the time. It's a fungus that attacks their, their nose, and then when they hibernate, it wakes them up, and uh, they, they die. And uh, millions and millions of bats have died in the east, and it's heading this way. The hope is that the Rocky Mountains will stop it. So um, it's a way to monitor our bat populations, too. They're, they're a really critical component of our ecosystem, too. Thank you, Jane. All right, yes, the bounce. Uh, okay, we're going to have a break for lunch. And so don't run away. After lunch, we're going to talk with BC Timber, Timber Sales, Cattle River Management. We're going to have an update, very short update, from our MLA John later. And so don't go away because we feed you well here, too. So, there you go.